Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Get Down to Business. I'm Terry, Director of Marketing for ADAC, and we are thrilled to have you all here for our annual Get Down to Business event. It's one of my favorite events that we do here. Just a few things to note. Um, first, I want to thank um, ASID and Business of Home for sponsoring this event and bringing a great lineup today. In your seat, you will find a schedule of events um, that outlines every all the four sessions today. All four of them will take place here in the presentation room. We also will take a 45 minute break after the second session. And the Hungry Peach is on site if you plan on staying for the day and wanna grab a bite to eat. They do have these handy QR codes set up outside at the coffee bar where you can order online. They do ask that all orders be placed by 1215. And then just a reminder to make sure you're back by one o'clock for our third session. Don't forget to follow along um, and follow us on social. You can use at ADAC Atlanta. Make sure you're tagging us. And then also the hashtag for day, today's event is get down to business at ADAC. And all that information is also on your schedule. And then lastly, all of our events today are being recorded and we will send out the recordings um, a couple weeks from today and you will all receive a reminder email with the links. If you have any questions throughout the day, our team is here to help. Please reach out and let us help you navigate the building or answer any questions you have. And with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Lauren Davenport of Davenport Designs. She is also the 2023-2024 president of ASID. So she will take it from here and kick off our first session. Thank you. Hi everybody, thank you so much for coming. We're very excited. Um, to work with ADAC and ASID on this presentation of how to implement a lien and to protect your income. There are some great new legislation that has passed. I'll let John talk about that. And then Stacy is gonna talk about how to actually implement the lien. So with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, John <clears throat> Guest. He is the Vice President of Carson Guest. He's also the VP of Legislative Affairs for GAIDP. And for those that don't know, GAIDP is the Georgia Alliance for Interior Design Professions. He is one of the original founders, and GAIDP is a nonprofit legislative, legislative coalition of interior designers in Georgia. So basically, they are looking out for interior design nerves and the profession's best interest in making sure that we are protected with laws and um, or we have the same rights applied to us that other professions have as well. Stacy Hanley is the principal of Letkoff, Duncan, Grimes, McSween, Hass, and Hanley. <laughs> Uh, Ms. Hanley practices primarily in the areas of tax and estate planning, probate, estate administration, real estate, and closely held business matters. She was admitted into practice in Georgia in 1999. Stacy is a native of Atlanta, Georgia. She graduated from the Lovett School, then graduated magna cum laude from Washington and Lee University with a BA <clears throat> degree in classics and economics. Fun fact about Stacy is at Washington and Lee, she played on the first women's basketball team and was a member of the Kappa Kappa Gamma sorority. Was elected into Phi Beta Kappa, Phi Eta Sigma, and Omicron Delta Epsilon Honor Societies. Stacy began her legal career at Long Aldridge and Norman and the Commercial Real Estate Group. Stacy then became general counsel for Homes by Williams Craft, the home building company started by her father, Wilmont Williams. When Stacy's father unexpectedly died in 2015, Stacy experienced firsthand the complexities of the real estate administration process for family businesses. Stacy then decided to join Letkoff, Duncan, Grimes, McSween, and Hass so that she could utilize her practical and legal experience to help individuals and families navigate the estate planning and estate administration process. Stacy's been a speaker for several estate planning and fiduciary law seminars at the State Bar of Georgia. She's also presented the Atlanta chapter of FSP, the Financial Services Profession, and the Georgia Society of CPAs, and to other individual groups on the topic of engaging women in the financial and estate planning process. So thank you both to John and Stacy for being here. Um, we're very excited. 
So John, this past legislative session, the Georgia State Legislature amended OCGA section 44-14-360, which is Georgia's Mechanics and Material and Lien Law, to allow registered interior designers to file liens against real property on which they perform certain design services or supply materials. Today we will walk you through the new law and mechanics of how to exercise your rights as an interior designer under the new law. So basically this session is going to be Q&As with presenting questions and then at the end we'll save plenty of time for um, questions to John and Stacy. So John, please let me start with you. What was the impetus for passing of this new law? Well, a lot of designers and my firm included have uh, lost money on projects doing work and clients later saying they wouldn't pay for it, which is always disappointing. And so we wanted to have an easier way than full-blown litigation, if possible, to resolve the matter and to have a slightly bigger hammer in our hand when we ask for the payment we deserved. So we began by looking at the lien law and those covered. Every other registered design profession in the state of Georgia is covered by the lien laws. And so we felt it uh, just treating us equally to be covered as well for the services that we provide. So we started working on that 16 years ago and uh, it took us, I'm a little slow, it took <laughs> us a while to get through the Georgia House and Senate, but we did succeed, and uh, the law is is very good now for registered interior designers. Um, we had to go with registered interior designers simply because there is the legal definition of a registered interior designer in the law, and so uh, this puts us on an equal footing with architects, engineers, uh, foresters, landscape architects, and others when they try to collect bills that are due them. Sure. So that's, that's how it came about, and uh, it, it took us a long time to get there, but um, we are certainly glad that we did. But I will tell you, uh, now that we are covered like everyone else, it's, it requires a lot of homework to maintain that right. And I'm so grateful that we have Stacy here today to, to walk us through that process because it's, it's, it's technical and if we take advantage of it, we're protected. And if we don't, it's just like the old days. Exactly. John, let me ask you, the law provides that only registered interior designers have lien rights. What does one, what does one have to do to become a registered interior designer with the state? Well, you can go to sos.gov, which is the Secretary of State's website, and there is a very clear, uh, if you link on professionals, design professionals or professionals, uh, there's a very clear definition of, of how you become registered. Basically, now it requires a design degree, uh, experience, passage of the NCIDQ, uh, and and uh, application to the state and acceptance by the Board of Architects and Interior Designers. That's wonderful. Thank you. All right, Stacy, can you walk mm -hmm. us through the process of actually filing a lien? Absolutely. Let's do it. Good morning, everyone. Um, prior to this law being passed, if you basically got sideways with your client and they owed you money and they hadn't paid you, you had to go file a lawsuit and get a judgment against your client. In the meantime, whatever property you had performed work on, that client could sell it, reduce that property to cash, move that money wherever, and you would spend your time chasing that money to try to get paid. And, you know, chasing money is expensive. Now, what this law sort of does is sort of preserve the property as collateral from a potential judgment. So if you take the steps and get a lien, which is basically a cloud on that real estate, that person cannot sell that property until this lien has been dealt with. So what it's doing is giving you leverage against the property owner, or potentially leveling the, leveling the playing field in a lawsuit. Because um, 
So this law is very technical. It's been around for a long time. And in 2008, it went under a major overhaul with notice requirements and deadlines, and, and it became just very technical of how you had to enforce these lien rights. And then 21, we now have where we've let interior designers you know, also get in with surveyors, engineers, architects to enforce these lien rights. I think it's important to point out um, with this law that it's sort of raising this, you know, the standard of your industry. It's giving you all more gravitas, more like the you're now you know, considered professionals. And with that, you should act like professionals. And we're gonna talk about this today as part of filing a lien. So I've got a little, am I echoing a little bit? A little bit? A little. Yeah. I feel like there's a, is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry, I just felt like I was hearing that in my ear and that was bothering. So I'm gonna, this is sort of, I've sort of presented a timeline of just of how this process sort of works. So you can kind of look at the pictures over here. So the first part is prior to commencing work, you should have a contract with the owner. And a lot of times I see design professionals will submit a proposal. And like, you know, I'm gonna do, you know, decorate your house or do whatever these things are for this amount of money. And the owner says, great. And like, and, and that's basically the terms in it. So, and I know you're gonna, get more depth later on today with how to you know, your contract, but I strongly suggest that you have your contract reviewed by an attorney or have an attorney draft your contract. Like I said before, you're now professionals, and if you've seen an architect's contract or surveyor's contract, I mean, they're pretty detailed. So I just sort of kind of put forth just some sort of minimum terms that I think you need in your contract and where I see them kind of go awry. Um, scope of work, have that work clearly defined. I'm gonna spend approximately four hours at $200 an hour doing these five steps. Because what I find is that most people grossly underestimate how much time it takes you to do something. You know, you think you're going to the tile store and you're gonna be picking out all this tile in 30 minutes. They don't realize you're gonna be there eight hours dealing with this stuff. I find that clients also what, you know, what they want, when they want, how they want in their own way. And, it, and you need sort of define how we do the selections. I submit a, this design board to you. I want approval in 10 days. I don't want to wait for you for three months to think about this while I'm trying to work on this. I'm having all these timelines set. Have no language that says owner sole discretion, owner can decide you know, whether they're going to pay you, owner can decide whether they like it. They can, I mean, get all those terms out of there. Um, purchasing and warranty terms. Do you have the right to substitute, pro and I've seen before where you know, dining room chairs you picked out are no longer in stock and you're going to substitute it. And then they freak out and that's not what I wanted and I'm not paying you. Do you have the right to substitute those type of materials? Um, your payment terms and cancellation. I would advise that you advise that you now have lien rights in the contract, that they are put on notice, that you can lien them if they don't pay you. Um, do your costs get reimbursed? Does your time and mileage get reimbursed? You're from me, whatever you're working on. Um, also, provisions, you have the right to hire other people to help you. You know, having things about you can photograph your work, you can publish it on social media. And then, what I find most doesn't happen is having legitimate termination terms. You've taken on a job and you think it's gonna take nine months and 30 days into the project, the owner fires you. And now, I mean, you've you know, foregone other opportunities. Should you be paid for that opportunity cost you missed? Should there be a termination fee? Should you be reimbursed for time you've already spent? Like not having all that spelled out in this contract, it gives people unrealistic expectations. And that's what leads to disputes, as you'll hear more about today, is where people go sideways when they think it's gonna be X or cost X and it's Y plus plus. And same with you, you think also too, I think this client's gonna be great, 60 days in, I can't work with this jerk. This person's abusing me, they're not whatever, I want out like of this deal. So giving your ways to do that. I'm gonna go back a minute. So once you've got the contract under going, so then you start working. This is where this gets tricky. So before beginning work on a project, you have got to find out in the real property records whether an owner or general contractor has filed a notice of commencement. And if they have filed a notice of commencement, then you have your own sort of notice obligations. Then that means, then if you do that, you can request a general contractor. And I don't, how many of you actually deal with owners in residential projects, just like John Smith on Oak Avenue? Okay, and how many of you get hired by a builder or bigger general contractor to come in and provide services? Okay. Yeah, so we, so we get a little bit of both. Most likely, you know, John and Mary Smith are probably not going down, rec you know, recording a notice commitments in the Fulton County public records. But if you're on a big job, most likely the, the GC is filing this. So I'm gonna go to the next slide real quick. 
Let's talk contract, sorry, okay. So if a notice commencement is filed, you have to file a notice to the contractor within 30 days of starting work, letting them know who you are, your information, that you're a potential leaner, you're a potential lead claimant. So yeah, you look at that right there. So if you have that notice commencement filed, you have to do that. If they don't file it, you do not have that obligation to do that. You can already see that, okay? Okay, sorry, I'm gonna go back a little bit. Sorry, I'm gonna keep going back to this timeline, sorry. So there's different pathways with the notice of commitment. So you file the, you know, your notice to the contractor. You also can make, file a preliminary lien to the owner. So everybody, is, what you're doing is putting everybody on notice that you've got the right to file a lien. Now, you start working on the project. And work becomes, while you're working on the project, this is where I see things go awry, where documentation starts to fall apart. Because if you file a lien and you're potentially gonna go battle out the client, I guarantee you they are going to turn around and sue you on a counterclaim for breach of contract that you didn't perform the work according to the contract. So this is where, while you were working, where I advise you to document what you're doing with whatever it is, pictures, delivery, you make sure that you are substantially in compliance with what you said you were going to do. If you go, you do the work, in 90 days passes, you're paid, that's when you have the right to file a lien, within 90 days of performing the work. This is very important. A claim of lien comes due on the last date the labor materials or services were furnished, not the date the payment is contractually obligated to be paid. So if you say, okay, I'm doing all the services and you owe me this money in 30 days. It's not at the end of the 30 days that the lien, the time starts ticking. It was the date, the last date you performed the services. So you deliver all the furniture to the people's house, you get all the thing, and you say, okay, all this is due in 30 days. It was the date you delivered it is when this 90 days starts ticking that you have to file the lien. So most people have this misconception, it's when the payment was due and became unpaid. So please, as a takeaway, please remember that. So again, you need to keep records of when you delivered it, when you perform time, especially if you're doing hourly consulting work and you have timesheets showing the date you worked on it. Um, if you do deliver furniture, have the client sign off that yes, this was delivered on October 25th, this date. So everybody's aware of when this clock starts ticking to file the lien. After filing the claim of lien, you have 365 days to basically, what we call, enforce the lien or make a lien action. What this means is file a lawsuit, have an arbitration. So at the end of the day, you will probably have to file a lawsuit to actually enforce your lien. It has to be taken down to a judgment in a court of law or in an arbitration proceeding. And once that claim of lien is perfected, then you have other rights. You've got the right to foreclose on the property as it becomes an encumbrance on the property, or you wait till the owner sells or refis, and then your lien gets paid off. Um, in addition to filing that lawsuit, you also have to file a notice in the public records that you have commenced a lawsuit, letting the whole world know that there's now a lawsuit pending against this property. Also, with this new lien law, you are probably gonna be required to execute lien waivers. So basically saying that you, you know, upon condition of receiving this payment, I hereby waive all my lien rights. And a lot of times I see this happen where it's not, here's the check, give me the lien waiver. What they will wanna do is have you sign a conditional lien waiver saying upon receipt of the payment, you're waiving all your lien rights because they gotta go collect the money from the owner. And the owner won't release the money till they have all these lien waivers. So Georgia amended the law actually just recently in 21 as well, basically saying if you sign a lien waiver, a conditional lien waiver, it needs to be conditional upon receipt of the payment, not I hereby waive all my lien rights. So someone should review, if somebody puts a lien waiver in your face, have an attorney review it. Because if you signed a lien, conditional lien waiver and you do not get paid, then you can file an affidavit of non-payment, basically saying that lien waiver is not in effect but you still have to file your lien within the same 90 day period. So the upshot of all this, Lauren and John, is that this law is very technical with a lot of notice requirements and a lot of, and the actual lien that has to be filed, I'm gonna show you what it looks like at the end here. It's very specific. Mm -hmm. It requires a legal description on the property, a very you know, specific description of the amount owed, you know, the lien should say plus interest because you're entitled to statutory interest, so you're not collect. Like this needs to look pretty much exactly like this. And your, what was the work performed needs to be very specific of what was done. So, I mean, it's, it's a pretty complicated technical law. 
But I think, as I said before, it gives you, it secures the property as collateral on the front end of your lawsuit, not on the back end. Thank you, Stacy, for explaining all of that. It is, it's very complicated. There are a lot of steps to it. You know, most of the time when it happens, you're, you're too far into it. So knowing how to, knowing what the overall process is to be able to protect yourself from the get-go is, is, is so important. But I do have some questions. Can you put a lien on a property for your design time not being paid? Yes, John and I just talked about how they battled out this definition with the architects and Georgia legislature. So interior design is defined under the statute, I'm gonna just read this, as the rendering or offering to render designs, consultations, studies, planning, drawing, specs, contract documents, and other technical submissions. So the, the short answer is yes. There's a lot of factors at play here about what makes sense, to, when it makes sense to suit. It's not necessarily a money threshold. Um, you can find lawyers to do things for smaller amounts, but a lawsuit typically, I mean, you, you're gonna spend a minimum $10,000 filing a lawsuit. I mean, and to file the lien is, you know, twenty, you know, $5, and you know, somebody probably, attorney will probably charge you $250 plus recording costs and file that lien. But filing a lawsuit, you're gonna be prepared for $10,000. And, and if you're up against Goliath, he's gonna turn around and sue you, I mean, you could suck in numerous times. So unfortunately, it's not an easy answer. It has to be evaluated, like I said, on a, a sort of myriad of factors. But you, let's say someone didn't pay you $25,000 and you're looking at $10,000 in legal fees, it might be that you go, I'm not sure this is worth it, and I cut my losses and try to get as much as I can. I mean, could you turn it over to a collection agency? You've got to you've got to resort that. I mean, you're saying it's like just like a suit on it. Like you have to get a judgment. I mean, the key is getting is, is getting judgment. You're saying like an account where like they owe you. You've got sort of suit on an account, basically. Yeah, the lien law is giving you sort of. Leverage, and maybe it's that leverage is like I'm filing this lien that's going to sit on your property so that you go to refi, and you're trying to force a settlement with the client. So I think it helps you get to that position of trying to force the settlement that you can file the lien. Um, but again, as far as like whether you turn around and do a suit on an account and try to turn over collection, I mean, typically you need judgments to get to enforce these things and actually get garnished wages. I mean, do all the things that once you've got a judgment, there's still post judgment collection, which is expensive. I mean, that's why. Um, again, as y'all are going to hear about later today, I mean, having good contracts and everything, I mean, this is the worst case scenario, is ending up in litigation. I mean, that, it's not, I mean, it's never, um, it's never a good scenario. And I, you had a follow-up question, I'm sorry, what that, about the, at your time. Okay. Time is always hard. I mean, I build time too, and that's where people get um, angry. So a lot of times what I will do is if I don't really know, I will say, okay, I'm going to give you X services for this amount. Anything else is at my hourly rate. Well, if you've been a part of the meetings, then you know we were both there meeting. Where it gets funky is like, like you're on your own doing your stuff. So the best you can estimate that, and I would maybe just overestimate and come in under. So if you think this is gonna be 20 hours of work, I'd say 25 and come under. And then, because that way the client's pleasantly surprised as opposed to, you know, you're trying to, but we all get in this habit, we all want to do this because we all want the job. We want to underestimate. We want to say, oh, God, you know, it's only going to take me 10, then you're going to, you know, no, it's going to take you 20 just because you want to get the job. So again, I just be very clear with the expectations of what you're doing and how much it's going to cost. Is that helpful? Is that helpful? Okay. Hi. Hi. I have a question regarding, um, let's say, as a designer and the property you're working with, there are actually two owners for the property. And let's say you come in agreement with both owners or one owner or whatever, and then there's a disagreement that occurs between the owners, right? So the owners have gotten into conflict, and now they're kind of combating them on each other, and they want to change certain things um, that could infect the original contract you had with them. How, what would be the best, how would you go about doing that? Um, would you have to then go against two owners if there was a, a breachment in contract or disagreement in the contract based on whatever conflict they may have had among each other with the property? How would you go about solving that? Any laws that help you uh, try to solve if there are two owners, two or more owners of the property? That's a really good question. 
Yeah, that is a good question. And you see that a lot, right? I mean, typical husband, wife, right? Yeah. Wife's been doing it, the husband comes in, God, I hate this. You know, like we're all coming in and like ripping it out. <laughs> um, I would put both joint owners, if it's a situation where in your contract, who has got authority under this contract? Who is, who is the owner representative? That would be good in your contract. The owner representative is the only person I'm dealing with. So if you want, you're gonna identify that person and that is the only person who can work with me under this deal. So the other owner comes in and that's between you two. I'm dealing with the owner representative. So I would make, I would designate who is the authority to deal with you. Um, was that it, something you would put in your contract, yes. Stacey, even though like, you know, Jane and John Smith are the owners of this property at, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the address is. My point of contact on this project is Susie versus John? Yes. Okay. Because we do that with corporations. If you're dealing with, you know, XYZ LLC, who am I talking to here? Is it, you know, this, I mean, anybody can be calling you at any time. So you have to know who you're supposed to be dealing with. Because if you're dealing with, you know, somebody who called up and said, well, he didn't have authority to make that change. Well, it's a representative of your company, so I would always identify the owner representative. Um, and if you're, you know, if you're filing the lien against the property, both owners will be subject to that lien, regardless if only one was under your contract. But again, always know who you're dealing with and make them decide. Like, I'm not gonna deal with, come in where husband comes in at the end of the day and blast me out for this color and then she picked it out and that, I mean, you're not dealing with their marital dis discord. I mean, you're dealing with <laughs> this, so. <laughs> Well, yeah, sometimes, of course you are. And I said, y'all are, I mean, you're, yes. especially when you're in their homes. I mean, you're in a very personal situation where everybody's, you know, drinking coffee or wine at the end of the day and we're all friends. And they, I mean, like, you've got to keep it, you know, it's hard not to do it. We designers didn't know. And not only would we be <laughs> designers, but also part psychiatrists, psychologists. Of course. Marriage counselors. That's mm -hmm. what I said. My, it's like 90% counseling, 10% legal. Exactly. I mean, that's most of what everybody does here. Yes. There's a, there's a lot more that goes into it than just picking beautiful furniture. Well, yeah, because you're, as I said, you're dealing with their homes, which is like a reflection of who that they are. I mean, exactly. It's very personal. Absolutely. Once I was dealing with a managing partner of a 400 person law firm. <laughs> oh, wow, he, oh, wow. He said, he said, John, I don't practice law. I'm an industrial psychologist. <laughs> yes, exactly, <laughs> I'm sure, yes. Very true, very true. I have just one quick question. How often should designers be updating their contracts and is it important to consult with your attorney for every minor tweak or change or is it just like more of the major contract updates that require you to consult with your legal team? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, Whew. Um, I mean, laws change all the time. I mean, you know, we just had a law change in 21. I think I said earlier, I saw even an attorney who didn't realize that basically thought a lien that was done incorrectly based on a 21 law change and I don't, they were. So, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not trying to make this the Stacey Hanley Employment Act, but I just, like, I think if you, if it hasn't been reviewed in the last, like, three years, I just have updated. Um, if you're up against, if somebody's changing your scope of work, but they're changing legal terms that you necessarily, and where I see this, if you, if I, Lauren brings me a contract for my owner, I'm gonna get that owner out of that contract within 10 days no termination notice. Like if my owner doesn't like what Lauren's doing, I'm gonna try to get my owner out with minimal cost as possible. So if someone's monkeying around with your termination rights or your whatever, like I would have that reviewed and make sure you understand what the legal ramifications of that are. And I'm gonna give my owner also as much discretion as possible to approve or not approve what Lauren's doing. So I'm going to, so again, if you don't, you know, when in doubt, I mean, I mean, there's plenty of attorneys who do this for reasonable cost. It's not always, you know, big Atlanta law firm that you need to go hire. I mean, there's plenty of attorneys who are experienced in contract law that can do this reasonable for you. So, um, sorry, question. Yeah, I think we had a question here. Hi, um, I would like to know, some, sometimes for residential, we do like small jobs. And is that okay to have like kind of an agreement or terms and conditions on your invoice and when they accept and book it, they will sign it? Because sometimes like a full agreement can scare the clients. They're like, oh my God, like you're gonna, I don't know, like redecorate my dining room and there are all the terms there. You know what I mean? I, I don't know if that will be valid or not. Yes, absolutely. I mean, a contract can be very simple. I mean, I could, you know, write one on the back of this and say, you know, I, you know, 
I, you agree to you know pick up my dining room paint color, and I agree to pay you 250 bucks for that. Yeah. That's a contract. There's been consideration, and I get that. I mean, you've got to operate your businesses. So the legal is one aspect of it. You have to also be you know customer friendly, user friendly. So you've just got to use your judgment. So if you're like, this is just overkill, but yes, have it on something simple okay. that with payment terms and how that is. Right. I agree. Don't give them 10 pages exactly. and be like, you're signing yeah. life away for me to pay out your paint color. I mean, I I absolutely get that because you're still operating businesses and want to be. So I think you could have situations like that where you have sort of the small job deal. But if you're taking on something that's massive, that, that could literally take you under if this thing went awry, I mean, then I would have it looked at. If it's just the smaller things, and if I lose 250 bucks, so be it. I'm not, I mean, I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah. Anyone else have a question? I do, if nobody else does. Okay. Okay. okay, so in your contract, you have this great contract and everything is, you know, spelled out and, you know, you've got all your legal language, but then you present them their invoice to pay. So in my, in my case, all clients pay for all goods up front. So they've paid it. Then they're like, wait, wait, wait. I've changed my mind. Well, that's clearly stated in all of you know my contract things that there are no cancellations. You can't get your money back. Most items are special order, and they won't even give me my money back. Mm -hmm. Because money has changed hands, and it is in your contract, but also, does that mean that because money has changed hands, you've sent them an invoice with all your legal language that that's binding as well? So, so say, so say they, you know, you've, they've paid for these, we'll use dining room chairs. Okay. And it's been three weeks and all of a sudden they've changed their mind. Okay. All of the orders have been placed on my end. Money has exchanged hands between myself and my client. Money is also exchanged hands between myself and whoever the vendor is we're ordering. So they paid you for this, this mm -hmm. stuff. Okay, got it. So now they want their money back. Because they don't like it. Because they don't like it or they changed their mind or, or what have you. Well, I think your contract says no refunds once it's been paid, like, tough, I mean, right. basically. So, but is there any, say then that they file a lawsuit with you, right, to get their money back or, or what have you, and the whole thing goes awry. Do you have any legal recourse then if they're trying to sue you to get their money back for their chairs, even though it's clearly stated in your contract? It, they can sue for anything. Yeah. It's like you can indict anybody for anything. <laughs> but you'll win. Yeah. Don't you think? Yes. They asked okay. you to order it. You ordered it. You performed the contract, period, hard stop. So I think, yes. I mean, yes. Again. Just because you might win a lawsuit does not necessarily mean a lawsuit, you know, it, it depends on situation, situations. Sure. Like we've said, it can be super expensive. Even if you can be, you know, on principle as right as right can be, but it could still, they could still bury you in legal fees just to enforce this. So and again, as I talked about before, you're going to sue Sally, whatever, and Buckhead, and she's going to go up to the country club and tell everybody how terrible you are. I mean, you got to, you know, evaluate those things. Exactly. Are there any other questions from anybody? <laughs> You want to avoid lawsuits as much as possible, right? And so one thing you put in your contract is that you stay out of court if you have a dispute. You can go to arbitration, mediation, something like that. Because, you know, we talked about this right before. And yeah. um, basically, we were, we we're saying that, you know, you're up against people that really know how to manipulate. There, it's the big guy versus the little guy. And the little guy, in this type of situation, you might win, but you're going to spend a lot of money trying to win. And you don't want to win on principle. So mm -hmm. you want to stay out of court. You want to, before that, you want to avoid. You just want to avoid. So stick around at 1 o'clock. I'll answer any question you want, I'll, you know, even after that. And um, we'll talk about the details of the contract. I saw a lot of you guys taking pictures of the slides, which is awesome for you guys. <laughs> you made good slides. You know, but all of that, I mean, we'll go into detail into all of that. So I think um, we're on a good path for today. And thank you. I learned a lot. Okay. I learned a lot. Awesome. Thank you. Well, if there are no more questions, then I want to thank everybody so much for coming today. Um, we're very excited to present this to you. And thank you to John and to Stacy.
for taking the time to come and, and, and talk about this process as well. And if you're not a member of ASID, we'd love to have you join. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, we'll take a quick 15-minute break and then start back up with our second session at 11.15.